D&D Beyond now fits in the palm of your hand with the free D&D Beyond app. It's the perfect tool set for beginners, regular players, and seasoned dungeon masters. Play faster with the guided character creator and access your character sheets, spells, and abilities wherever you go. All of your adventures and source books are at your fingertips, even when you're offline. Easily find and access the rules you need when you need them. With more features to come, download the free D&D Beyond app today. Welcome back to D&D Beyond Live. We're just, uh, we're making friends off camera, uh, bonding over uh, the shared uh, values of not liking me much. Uh, kidding, kidding. Uh, that was private, Joe. That was private. <laughs> our, our open to stay for you was not meant for the camera. Our public yes. personas love you. Exactly. <laughs> I'm joined by uh, two of my favorite people, Sage Ryan and Riley Silverman. Um, uh, welcome to the show. I'm Joe. I'm the content clown at uh, at D&D Beyond and Phantom Tabletop. Uh, today, I, I'm actually really excited about this. Never say that I don't look at the comments because I am watching. Uh, we did uh, we did two streams about uh, building a D&D city where we built a, a city uh, with chat, which I really really love. So make sure you guys go check those out uh, if you haven't seen them. You built a twisted, broken, horrible. Uh, death trap of a town and I absolutely love you for it uh, but someone in the comments of the YouTube VOD was like hey this is cool and all but I feel like uh, when I DM cities never really pop when like my, my players go to a new town or to like an exciting you know an, an exciting new locale uh, my theater of the mind never really like pops and it's not very immersive and it's very like this is this place and uh, now you're here, what would you like to do? Um, so I thought it would be cool to do um, uh, a video about like, hey, what are some, I gathered two of my favorite DMs together uh, to sort of put together some, you know, some tips and tricks and some thoughts around how to really make uh, your party visiting a city like really immersive and how to really up your theater of the mind game and your description game uh, uh, to jump into that and just make it really like high value uh, for players. I um, want you to picture it, that death trap you built. Absolutely. Like really you, feel it. You made this. Now it. you live in it. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> this is from my brain and now it's in your soul. <laughs> um, you know, I, I very much wish I had the, the, the butter melty voice of Matt Mercer and his ability to just paint a beautiful picture just with, the, with the simple, like, like the, he can just exhale and I go, I can see it. Yeah. Um, and I, I have to imagine, I, though, that's partly because he's he sold his soul a long time ago for D&D. &D. No, I, I think that I, I, I get the impression from Alexandria that Matt has been building Alexandria for a very, very, very long time and kind of mm -hmm. has this world in his head. So I think it's like almost like if if you know someone who builds model trains in their basement and you go down in their basement and you're never coming back, first of all, but if you go down in their basement, they'll tell you all the things like, oh, I, this is the area that I built and this is what I did and this is what I worked on. And like, they've got mm -hmm. a lot of thoughts on it because they've been spent, this has been their hobby for so long is spending their time to it. So I feel like with Mercer and Exandria, he's got this world. It's not like he just started playing this world with his, yeah. with his, with these, this group. As we all know, they're a long standing home game, but also I, I just feel like Exandria is his model train in the basement where he just knows this world inside and out. And I think that as audience members, we can sometimes get discouraged by that because we don't we haven't been building this town for this this world for 20 years. We might make a lot of us are are starting uh, if we're running a new campaign, we might be running a campaign out of a book using a setting that's already existed or whatnot or something we're homebrewing for the first time or within a few months. So I, I think that like that's I'm sorry, I'm sorry that I cut you off, Joe, but I think that's like yeah, my feeling about like it's kind of like if you are a new acting student, you don't go, well, I'm not ever going to, I'm not as good as, as Meryl Streep or someone. You're like, yeah, but that's because she's been doing it for so long and she's the best at right. it. So yeah. And yeah. If I can, the nice thing. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Sage, if go ahead. I can add anything to that, it's if someone does invite you into their basement to look at their model train collection, uh, think about it hard before you do. Mm -hmm. um, I have concerns. The <laughs> The trick there uh, is that my dad's is in the garage, which is not mm. a basement garage. It's on the same level as the rest of the house. I feel safer. Uh, <laughs> so it's just it's just much safer, and there's a clear way out. I feel um, like a basement garage would be a pretty 
unless you're like living in like a building that has like a subterranean, like that's a pretty inconvenient place to put a garage for most houses. I think that's more of like an X-Men jet hanger. Okay. Yeah. Uh, over yeah. top and you're, yeah. Um, By the way, hundred percent. When I said jet. model train in the basement, I was picturing that guy from Mighty Wind. That's like <laughs> bring, bring like uh, Catherine yeah. O'Hara's husband of the town of Crab. Yeah, I, that's hundred percent. I want to see Crab Town in the winter. Like that's hundred percent what I imagined in my head. Just close to uh, to to my dad's setup. Yeah. Um, but so the uh, I think the nice thing about that sort of uh that discouragement of like man i, I you know i have a hard time just naturally br bringing these places to life and i do um uh uh you can cheat there's lots of little techniques and and little cheats that uh that you can do for yourself um that that can really just be nice shortcuts um to just adding a couple of extra levels uh to your storytelling that i think your table will really appreciate um, and the, the simplest one I, I kind of wanted to jump into was, um, uh, it's in two steps. Uh, and the first step is, uh, to write down at the top of a piece of paper or, you know, however your DM setup is, whether it's like a stack of spiral notebooks that look like all kidnap letters, you know, like, like I write when I, when I'm just like, Oh, we got to go here. Random. Um, uh, yeah, just all full ransom note style. Uh, but the first is to, to put a reminder at, at the top of something that's just always visible for you, whether it's just eyeline with your DM screen uh, or wherever, uh, is, is that it's okay to pause and think. It is okay to pause, take a breath. You know, if your players are like, we want to go into this bistro, what's it look like? You don't owe them an immediate like, Oh, well, you see the reclaimed beams coming down and blah, blah, blah. It, it's okay to kind of take that moment and ask yourself, like, what does this place look like? Mm -hmm. and then after that pause, um, uh, under that reminder, uh, which I have anytime I DM, uh, I just have the five senses listed. And um, I try to answer a question about one of the five senses with a description. And I think that that's a real nice, simple, easy trick uh, to immersing yourself in a city. Um, it's the difference between uh, what I always go back to from my life is when I first moved from Bowling Green, Kentucky to San Francisco uh, with everything I owned in like two suitcases. Like I, I, nobody was with me. My, I got off the plane. My buddy was like, hey, I know I said I was gonna meet you. Uh, uh, I'm late, so just go to our apartment. <laughs> and um, uh, I'd never really been in a big city before. I got off at Market Street in the middle of San Francisco, like at the, like the busiest hour. All of a sudden, more people than I had ever seen in one place, like in my life, just all over the place. And to me, that's what immersion in a big city like feels like. And if I can give that experience to a player, I think that's really cool. So it's like, it's it's the difference between being like, man, you're in this city block and it's super crowded to um it's you're in the city block and you're overwhelmed by uh what's it sound like it's a symphony of of voices um it's a million people all talking over each other at the same time to be heard um it's uh you you step into this place and you think there's a storm at first but then you realize it's just traffic whether that's horse and carriage or cars or whatever your game is uh that you're playing or if it's there's an overwhelming smell uh, where I was able to afford in San Francisco. There was an overwhelming smell. It was urine. And uh, um, on a good day, on a good day. Fair. Um, uh, you know, so if, if, if that's, you know, uh, that smell or uh, on the opposite side, if this is a friendly sweet town and you're trying to get across the idea of safety, maybe it just smells like baked goods. You know, the, the hot donut sign at Krispy Kreme is lit in this town. Uh, so pick a sense and, and and answer a question ab about it um, is is my favorite first like go to trick just to add a little layer um, of immersion. And now I demand tricks from the two of you. <laughs> and a tribute. <laughs> and a tribute. Yeah, absolutely. I think that picking a sense is a really clever idea as well. Something that actually came up for me recently. I was a player in a game, um, and it was in uh, the Black Dice Society. And we entered into an area of Ravenloft that one of our players was just like a huge fan of in lore. Um, so 
B. Dave Walters, the GM, offered the player to describe it mm. and was like, what do you see in front of you? And that was something that like totally in the moment, I was just like, wow, what? that's really cool. Uh, and I, I love still being able to be surprised in this game. I think that's my favorite, but like he, he set a tone for like, here is the location, here are the basic structures of what you can do, but like, what mm -hmm. are you experiencing right now? Uh, was such a cool way to do it too. And it might buy you a minute as well. If you need that moment to take a breath, you can let your player and be like, Hey, you know, what is, what is this environment kind of look like to you? What are you seeing if you're at a dark carnival in Ravenloft? Uh, and then you can build off of what your players kind of given you to work with. And, and you know that you're giving them something that they want to see here in this moment. I thought that was really special. That was just a cool moment recently. Yeah, no, I, I that's an absolutely a tool that I forget all the time is, is that idea that you're telling a story with your players at your table and you are not necessarily responsible for like every nook and cranny mm -hmm. of the experience that's happening. Um, yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. Not only does it buy you a little bit of time, but you, you uh, your player has given you something that they are now invested in, maybe a little more than what you would have given to them because it came from them. And now you can turn it against them, um, uh, which uh, is, is my favorite. You know, backstory mm -hmm. isn't the only thing that you can turn into a brutal weapon of, of terror uh, against your players. You can turn this, uh, if they're like, oh, um, you know, I see, uh, I see uh, in, in this like marketplace, there's, um, there's this guy selling it what looks to be like magical items over there, then oh, I'm, I'm taking it, I'm running with it. Like, not only did I not think about a magical item table in the middle of uh, in the middle of this part of the square, but yeah, let's run with it. Like, yeah, fun. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna buy a couple monkeys paws, my friend. Um, super fun idea. Riley? Do you have any uh, thoughts, tips, tricks? Yeah, I, I think I love that. I love letting players build something, especially if they're already, I mean, cause like there's kind of two different ways that characters will experience a city in a game, right? Sometimes you're starting the game in that city and it's your home city for your characters. So you're giving them the ability to like kind of build that home for themselves and what their characters are doing normally. And then there's also coming upon the city for the very first time. And so that's a very different experience of uh, if they're just passing through somewhere or if it's part of the adventure. And a lot of times I, I will admit this is actually a thing that I struggle with, which is why I'm glad we're doing this conversation, because I'm not the best at describing things physically. I'm really not the, like I the amount of times I just throw the word filigree out, even though I don't think I 100 percent know what filigree actually means. I, I will say it or I'll say like bespoke or something like I, I'm good at like adjectives that don't 100 percent convey the information to the, the people that I want to. I honestly like I'm I'm not I'm not afraid to steal like I, I just when I'm when I'm DMing especially it's so it's not unlike when you make an NPC or something along those lines. I think that what I will do a lot of times is I'll think ahead of time about what I want the city to be like if I know the characters are going to a specific city. And then I will just like Google images of like a place that evokes that kind of imagery in my mind. And then mm -hmm. I will just like look at a picture and start to describe what I'm seeing in that picture and then just adding some things that like I, a great example of it that wasn't me is that one of my like a game I played a while ago was set in Waterdeep and the DM who ran it was from Seattle and he just made Waterdeep into fantasy Seattle and so it made it really easy to to bring art to understand where our characters fit in that world because he just took what he knew of Seattle and found ways to make it like these really interesting like twists on like what like what would you find in seattle what would you find in the fantasy version of that so you had this kind of like like hippie like like intersectional kind of thing happening but you also had like a section that was like a little more like like the humans district that were like being like persnickety about the dwarves and things like that and it just made this really cool interesting vibe going that's on with super it. fun i i love that and uh you guys watching uh hey thank you for being here i uh, appreciate it uh, if you've got questions, comments, concerns, uh, drop them into the chat. And uh, I want to make sure that, that we get into them because uh, you guys are uh, uh, part, of this, part of this conversation. Uh, so please, yeah, drop, just drop those in the chat. Mods will, mods will get them to me and, uh, and we'll answer as, as best we can. Uh, Riley, I think you bring up an amazing point, um, which sort of follows along this line of like, it's okay to cheat. Um, 
use what you know. Um, if your players are uh, in like a, a park or um, you, an, an office, you know, a, a building full of different little like offices or something like that, use what you know. Um, why necessarily like make up a place whole, wholesale when like, you know what park I still remember like vividly was uh, Cherokee Park in Louisville, Kentucky, the park that we'd always go hang out in in high school. I still, I remember every spot. I remember um, I remember the statue where shady things would happen. I remember the, the statue where like uh, kids had like their first kiss and you know, stuff like that and the fountains around it. Um, you know, I, I remember where people would like play ultimate Frisbee and, and stuff like that. I'll drop Cherry. That's one of my shorthand go-tos. I'll drop Cherokee park, uh, the fantasy version in there, you know, all the time. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a super, super good idea. Yeah. Because that's the thing about world building is that if you want to make a place feel lived in, like why not pull from things that, you know, are lived in, like, like you mm -hmm. mentioned, like that, that's where the kids make out. Because like, yeah, every city is going to be different from every other city and they're going to, but they're all going to have a few things that are in common or things that are relatively universal and like, like, yeah, a park, a place where the local youths go to hang out and get into maybe a little bit of trouble. You're going to have, we mentioned a bazaar, you're going to have some place that the residents go to do shopping, whether it's a bazaar or whether it's like, like a, just a market, whether it's like a general goods store. You know, you, and you think about that, you think about like, how big is this city? What types of things is it going to have? And like, what kind of provisions are common there? And mm -hmm. then you're off to the races, I feel like. I, I think that's where, like, I think you just get those few basic ideas and then you compare it to the climates that they're in and you kind of imagine that. Like, I, I don't know, like we talk about Mercer and I, I just recently listened to the episode of Critical Role where they, they're in Isilcross and they're looking and then they're looking for provisions and it's just a, gargan a gargantuan who just like, makes meat and just like she just like sells meat and she just has a room that's just like me like because they're not a city it's just a fort so she just has this this room full of a meat room. Of, of it's just wolves and mammoths and she's just here's the meat it tastes like meat that's what it is like that's and that's that character and that's what would be in mm -hmm. that area as opposed to being like oh here's our entire list of like smoked and fine fineries and stuff like that no absolutely uh, I have a, uh oh, Sage, you're muted. I muted myself. My bad. Oops, we lost Oops. you. Hi. Uh, and Welcome when back. referencing like cheat sheets as well, I think that something that is like a reminder is like, it's okay to write your intro to this town. You can mm -hmm. write it down in advance and you can read it off to them. And there's no, like, it doesn't have to be improvised off the top of your head. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've done this and I've had GMs that I absolutely love that did this, where it's just like, you know what? I'm gonna give myself a really self-indulgent moment for the first minute that we enter into this city where I get sure. to really describe this thing that I saw and give myself something to work off of. So it's like, don't be afraid to give yourself that cheat sheet as well mm -hmm. of something that like, you really want to have this like ah, i really want to describe it well but then when players are there and they're asking questions and i'm trying to improvise it off the top of my head suddenly i'm like uh, yeah there's a building there it's fine you can go in it do what you want i think that like i have trouble yep. with the like self-indulgent feeling a lot of the time in jamming sometimes i'll be like i just want to make it about you guys i want you to do whatever you want but mm -hmm. like i know when when i'm a player how much richer it makes the game to have that GM take a minute and really give us what, what they want that world to be. Yeah. Um, so like take your moment. And if it means like writing your moment in and like setting it out for yourself, uh, that's a perfectly fine cheat sheet as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Take yeah. that, take that intro. And then the first moment that they're like, what's that house that wasn't in that intro. Don't panic. <laughs> Yeah. Say, you know, ask yourself a question. And, mm -hmm. and if you want to write questions down for yourself and just pull from them, this is something else that I do. Um, uh, you know, what does your grandparents' house look like? What does your partner's grandparents' house look like? Just pick a grandparents' house and that's yeah. the house, you know? And then all of a sudden <laughs> you have this fully realized place that doesn't just like have a description attached to it. It has a very genuine, real feeling attached to it because there, there's a different tone in your voice when you describe a place that's important to you, uh, even the sort of fantasies, fantasized version of it, right? Mm -hmm. Then when you're just sort of like going off the dome, um, it, it's just sort of inherent. Um, I have a question uh, for you both. Um, 
Riley, you'll dig this one too. Sage, you're allowed to answer it too, I guess, whatever. A better um, answer be better than mine will be. Mm, yeah, I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. I'm going to pit the two of you against each other and only the winner. Are you going to ask us if elder brains have a sense of smell? Because that seems like that's. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't know that what was, my that mobs was from are asking that me. Was, that was from chat. <laughs> um, so Spellhawks Press asks, what's a great way to have a wild magic surge affect your city? Uh, sometimes they like to steal from movies like Weird Science or Jumanji. Well, I think that's a great thing. Like, I think, again, I'm, I'm all for cheating and stealing. So I think that if you... I, and I, you know, I just wrote that whole thing about WandaVision recently about how, mm -hmm. like, if you have a wild magic surge. I, I love to actually, with wild magic... I love to look for other people's wild magic charts that they post on the internet, or I also like to kind of like think about my own. And so, yeah, Riley is a thief. I'm fine with it. I'm a ro I'm, I'm cool with that. Someone in the chat just said, I, yeah, I love, I think that it's great to kind of look at what other people are doing with wild magic and then kind of build your own idea of what wild magic is. And then just compile a list it doesn't even have to be a hundred it can just be like 10 to 20 things and then when a wild magic surge happens roll on that chart and like let some fun happen with it so yeah i think that if there's if there's a pop culture thing that you love that is affected by some sort of random chaotic magic mm -hmm. use a version of it it's fine and i think jumanji is a great example of because there's so many different things that happen in those stories, right? There, there's, there's like the floor becoming quicksand. There's, there's monkeys in the kitchen. They're like, make them knolls. No one's gonna know. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. and I think yeah, making those uh, interactive uh, uh, for your players, you know, to 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 go off that Jumanji route, um, even if it's not something that's gonna be like, oh, this is gonna turn into a quest and a whole thing, you know, if it's like, you know, if it's from Jumanji, you know, oh, rhinos are in the apartment now. You know, what happens when you do something similar when your players are just trying to shop? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. I, I think that's that's super, super fun. Well, you can have fun with that too. If, if your game is a little more lighthearted, you can kind of make it a running gag then that like from then on, there's just like occasionally chaos happening as the rhinos. I have not like, if you've got guards trying to catch the rhinos and failing, you can be like in the middle of scenes and then you can just have like the rhinos come running by in the background while the guards are chasing him. And then the players have the opportunity then to make that part of the story of like, mm -hmm. oh, we're gonna use this chaos that was caused by the rhino train to be our like, the, the distraction we're going to use to sneak into this location we're trying to get into. Absolutely. Sage, you're wildly amazing. What's your, what are your wild magic oh, thoughts? Oh, stop it. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, it depends on kind of the tone of your game. Like my brain went to two different things for some reason. You were like, a, mal a wild magic surge hits a town. Uh, the first thing my brain said was it turns it into Candyland. Um, I don't, I couldn't tell you why, but that is the first thing that happened in my brain. Uh, and then the second one was invasion of the body snatchers. Um, and if that doesn't summarize, uh, my, my two people inside my brain, I don't know what does. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, and putting that in might give you a tool as well to be like, mm -hmm. ah, I didn't really establish what this city is like. Whoops. <laughs> well, the wild magic has accidentally made it Narnia. <laughs> Yeah, Good for absolutely. me. I am now describing Narnia. I don't think I have ever described something in a TTRPG game that I'm not picturing from a video game or a movie or something in my real life. Well, and I think that just reiterates the idea of like, because I'm the same way. We're, we are three people that aren't great at just locations off the dome, doing a video about how best to do locations off the dome. <laughs> And, um, but I mean, I think that's why it's a great conversation to have because if we were all great at it, then we're like, well, why not? You who be, cares? Like, yeah. The video is why don't you be better at it? Hey, you yeah. got you hey, want to know how to do this better? Just be better at it. Just do, do it. it. Just do it. Wrong with well, you? Why don't you just do it? Um, uh, well, I mean, Riley, you've been in games with me where I'm pretty sure I described the size of something in comparison to how many armies you could fit into it. Like, I'm not good at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at like. Okay, yeah, here's. Yeah, uh, here's how big something is. You, you know, mm -hmm. I so I I need cheats like this. Um, Rakio four hundred seven asks, "What's a good list of carnival games for a for an in game festival?" Oh man, I'm playing I in love... a carnival right now. <sighs> <laughs> well, I would you know I would always start with like um, again what what do you know so it's like what's your favorite carnival game i'll, I'll yeah. i would I'll, I'll always start there um mm -hmm. you know I, I think it's just there's just something really engaging about 
um, uh, you taking uh, your favorite time at a carnival and like converting that uh, to your table. I think there's just something extra. It, 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 even if you can't feel it, I think your players will feel just a little bit, a little bit oomph. Yeah. I also, I, I like going the opposite way of it too, is I think of what are some skill checks and then what are some carnival games I can build around those skill checks. So if I know that I have a character in my party, who's like a tough, like a, like a beefy girl or beefy boy mm-hmm. um, or beefy they, I, I will find, you know, I, I mean, obviously the most obvious answer to that is the, the hammer and the bang. But like, if you can think of something, I actually, I recently did a, in my, my Theros game that I, that I was running last fall, we, we had a festival happening in the Skola Vale where the uh, satyrs were and i essentially made and animated the the mechanical bull where i basically i had like a a, like a stuffed minotaur thing that the the characters would and so it was basically a series of of saving throws to see how long they could stay on the bull and then like the winner was whoever got to stay on the longest and it's Mm -hmm. similar like you can get drinking games like that or you can get you know you're making skill checks for how many you can throw in how many balls you can throw in a roll to knock over the, the the jugs and things like that you just it's really simple to think of what are common games and think of what are standard skill checks. And all you do is just make the DC of the skill check get progressively higher as they go to see Mm -hmm. how well they're able to successfully keep doing the check. Yeah. I think if I was setting up uh, like a segment of carnival games, I would set up one targeted for each player at the table. Um, Like you referenced of like Mm -hmm. having that like beefy character that wants to do the strength test. If you have an archer in the party, like I'm picturing Ren Faire style archery booth, you know, and Mm -hmm. letting them kind of take the thing that they do in like battle as a hero and put it in this like trivial carnival version of it, Mm -hmm. I think could be really, really fun. So I would be like, all right, we've got five stalls ahead of us and let them kind of figure out which one is for them where it's like, okay, so this one has a setup of targets and arrows. It looks to be like a, a kind of a janky wooden set of arrows and a bow. And someone's like, Oh wait, no, that one's for me. And like the moment when they realize that there's like something individual for each of them is really fun in a party. Um, or uh, they completely screw it up. And That's what they're say. Like, yeah. I pick up the arrow and you're just like, all right, man, I guess you're doing strong, man, then. But it can be so fun to make the players do the thing that's like not normally their thing. And yeah. then, and it's like, it's a lower stakes version of it because it's a carnival, but there is something about when you throw a carnival skill check in. I, I've never had a player not think it mattered. Like I've never had a player be like, this is just a dumb game we're doing. Like they, they get oh, yeah. really into it and excited about it. And it's really fun. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the only other uh, exercise I have, and then we have a, cu- a couple of other like cool questions from chat that I want to jump into. And then I set you free, my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, I set you free from a, from a pain of, uh, of being yeah. in a virtual world with me. I do have one um, more thought about, about world building yeah, in yeah, towns yeah. when we want to get if to that. Get, but if you want to say your last thing first, that could, before well, we move on. The only other, uh, this is the other exercise I have that I think sort of goes along with what Sage was saying about like, you know, write about your places a little bit, you know, take that moment write those three or four pertinent sentences, you know, uh, about a locale. And um, a trick that I like to use for writing that, I've talked about it a little bit um, with uh, with Jeremy. Uh, when he came on, we talked about uh, traps um, and sort of like using the environment for combat. But I think it works well here too. Um, and that's making a decision about three things in your environment, uh, the immediate environment, the general environment and the larger environment. And so uh, what I mean by that is like the immediate is literally like what is like right here. Uh, the general is what's I mean, this sounds very dumb and, and not very artfully described. The general is what's well, a little bit further out. And then the larger is like what's sort of like in the in the world sort of going on outside. Uh, so my favorite example, one of my favorite examples of that, uh, as it sort of turns to the the fantasy genre, is the prancing pony in in Bree in uh, Fellowship of the Rings. Your um, uh, your immediate environment for Frodo and his party is that cramped little table uh, where you know it, it's it's smished in, it's probably splintery, it's old, you know, it it, it doesn't really provide any uh, any comfort. Uh, the amount of drinks uh, almost like covers the table. So it's, you know, it's not very adequate. It's very cramped. Um, the larger environment is, uh, or sorry, the general environment is um, 
is the bar itself, which is just full of people with that are kind of like staring at you a little shifty, but then there's also like heat from this fire that's competing. So the, the, the atmosphere feels very cold, but then this fireplace you're next to sort of is competing with that and almost like trying to like uh, jab warmth into that coldness. Um, and then um, your larger environment, what's going on outside of that? Well, the most obvious thing is a across the way, uh, this creepy dude in a cloak and a pipe is just like um, mean mugging Frodo, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's that's one of my favorite sort of go tos for it. So, and you um, also have the detail yeah. of the city walls being closed at night and like how hard it's, it's yes. hard. Like there's a re this town is a little bit afraid of what's right outside its walls when the sun goes down. So like that's yeah. that's a huge detail for that town. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, that's something I really like practicing doing is is answering those three questions uh, for a place and that can really give uh, not only some immersion, but also some options and sort of sort of side po or sort of uh, guidelines of, uh, you know, because when your players enter a place, they're also like, what do, what do we do here? And what are we mm -hmm. supposed to do here? How am I supposed to feel? And they're sort of looking to you to answer some of those questions, not necessarily like ram them towards one, but just yeah. to like, offer those options. Absolutely. I think that going into a new city sometimes, if you're not there for a particular thing, if it wasn't, hey, go to this city and talk to this person, but you're traveling through somewhere, there is that feeling a lot of the time as a player of where you get there and you're like, okay, I don't know. Does somebody want to like get dinner or something? Um, so setting out beforehand, something I like to ask myself is like, well, what does this place need to make them feel to get them to the next thing? Does it need to make them feel like they're not welcome here so that they figure out mm -hmm. what's wrong? Does it need to make, does a town feel like, uh, everyone is low and depressed and they need to figure out yes. what the blight is causing, like what is causing the blight on this town. So like, if they're not welcome here, the table's a little too cramped like that. You know, everything's a little too small. Everyone's staring at you too much. The temperature is, is uh, uncomfortable in some capacity. Um, those things that make you feel like you shouldn't be here or mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, it looks like there's a stage in this tavern. Um, it looks like it hasn't been used in years. Right. Like, yeah. why has there been no bard at this tavern? Why has no one been performing? Why is it so quiet in this city? Mm -hmm. Where has the joy gone and who has caused it? Yeah. That are the floors be, clean yeah. or are they like movie theater feeling floors? Are your feet uh -huh. like sticking, you know, like that? That's a that's a great sense to play with as well. Riley. That was going to be kind of building on, on what Sage just said was the thought that I had that I was holding on to was that we're, we're talking a lot about physical and sensory elements to a town, but people are an extremely important part of a town. And if you are like myself and you're a GM who thinks a lot more in, in character ideas and story ideas, you can do very simple things. Like Sage just said, like, do you have the sense that you're not welcome here? Or is the town depressed? If you are someone who is more actively thinking about character stuff, you can really convey a lot about a town's environment and the town's feeling based on how the people who live in that town are behaving when you're there. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a shop and you just, you include, even if you're just describing it, just the detail of the towns keep like the, the shopkeepers being a little bit anxious or surprised to see you, or even just like shifting their eyes around a little bit when you're asking questions or vice versa, if they're very welcome and they're live and they're just very excited, like, and they're like, yes, please. Like maybe too excited, maybe a little bit like wait, someone's here. Like I, what are we going to do? Like, this is great. We have like in my, one of my home games that I play in, we have this thing where we it's, it's a salt marsh game and one time in one game one of our players was like trying to talk to he was trying to get in to talk to the town council and there was like a woman joyce who's like the administrative assistant of the of the council named joyce and he brought her a coffee and she was like so grateful for it and now it's just a thing where almost every time we're in salt marsh again and we're looking for information he goes and he gets joyce a coffee and basically flirts with her and like talks to her about information and it, it gives us such an idea of what the tone of this town is which is this very mm -hmm. like mon it's very just like middle of the road mundane a lot of administrative things going on and like a lot of like so like there's this like just put upon secretary who's essentially like feeding things through and that tells you so much about how the town council operates how information is dispersed throughout the town and just the overall tone of the city as opposed to if she was just like beleaguered and put upon and just frustrated and exhausted then you're like a lot of bad stuff is happening here and what do we got to figure out so yeah a barkeep can tell you so much about a town just by the way they're carrying themselves 
Cause like, you know, mm-hmm. it's like the traditional, you go into a town and you end up in a tavern, but the way mm-hmm. that the barkeep carries himself to me could tell you in the easiest way, everything someone needs to know about like the tone of that city. Yeah. Or if there's more than one tavern and like, mm-hmm. why is, why is this town? Like there's like maybe like the shady tavern and there's the more hoity hoity tavern. Like that can tell you a lot yeah. about the distinctions between social classes in that town. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, Let's see here. I've got got two more that that uh, that I want to jump in here. In here, uh, Simpleson says uh, uh, is asking, and and I'm interested in trying to tackle this from like a uh, from a describing the environment sort of immersion angle. Uh, how do you fit uh, an NPC's backstory, uh, including family and other sort of major things, uh, if you haven't prepared instead of just saying, oh well, that instead of just saying, oh they don't have one, so. Uh, you know, if you're kind of just off the cuff, like introducing an NPC uh, or something like that, how can you sort of like use the environment around them to give a sense of uh, of backstory in, instead of just maybe just being, you know, kind of being like, I don't know, they're just a person and they're on their own and kind of whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I think that your earlier advice, Joe, of just being willing to take a breath and take a step back and think mm-hmm. about it is is the way to go with that. And I think it's the same tools that you will use as a dm to react when players make decisions that you weren't expecting because it's it's i I guess i I come from an improv background so this might be a little bit like more in my wheelhouse anyway which is basically just like pause and go okay if this is true then where where does that come from and just kind of like be willing to take a step or two back and go look I, I, I'm, it's, it's hard without like a concrete example of, of what it is but like if let's say someone's like oh why how'd you open this store then you just take a pause and go well why would someone have this particular shop and mm-hmm. then you'd be like got it from my dad cool what yeah. happened to your dad king took him like like and you're you probably do have ideas about your city beforehand. So just kind of take the things you've already thought of for your city to be true. And then just imagine what it's what just take a take a breath and go, okay, so like, if if I know this is a city where Mm -hmm. there is some shady business happening, and has been for a while, Mm -hmm. then this character who's running this shop and they're like, their their dad disappeared, or dad was was arrested or something like that happened, like, Mm -hmm. boom, there's the next step. So it's I think it's just a matter of taking a pause, just thinking, okay, based on what I've already got and what this is, how can I marry those two and then take a step forward, so. Yeah, um, and I, I think uh, something interesting you just said too is uh, um, there's always that moment where you can stop needing to have information too. You know, like, uh, what happened to your dad? They're gone. Like, what happened to them? They were taken by who? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> and not only does that like give you some cool intrigue and like hook for your players and your players are going to be kind of like, Ooh, what's up with this? It also buys mm-hmm. you some time because yeah. now you got a week, you got another week or two mm-hmm. weeks or, you know, however often. Right. You're and yeah. also uh, characters don't have to out. answer honestly. Like mm-hmm. if someone came into my shop and started to ask me really personal questions about my life and I didn't know who they were, I'm not going to be like, Oh, well, here's all the, it's not like law and order where you're carrying boxes around. Like, well, that one came down to the docks this week. Like people can be cagey <laughs> and shady and like, yes, your characters could cast zone of truth and really kind of screw you, but you also can choose not to answer and just have the character get like, Especially, especially now, if someone comes in and casts magic on me and demands that I tell them things about my life, I'm especially gonna yeah. be like, I'm, we're not, we're not doing business anymore. I have yeah, a tendency. Absolutely. Maybe it's maybe it's too much Skyrim or whatever, but I I do have a tendency to just like it's the friendly, helpful NPC. I you you walked too close to them and they said this castle's been here for 150 <laughs> years, and you're like, well, thanks, thanks, random, dude, friend, dude. But think yeah. about that caterpillar in, in yeah. Labyrinth who tells Jennifer Connolly to go the wrong way. And that's like such a great example of an NPC that has information, but gives the wrong information to the protagonist right away. Yeah, I, I think that. that's really fun to like have that person who's like a plant uh, to kind of bait and switch them. There's also that possibility too of like, they start asking too many questions and you go, the shopkeep puts up a sign and ushers you out the door. Mm-hmm. Like you've asked too many questions, you've, you know, you can't do business here now. Uh, yeah. So if you don't have anything, you can set up that like, oh God, there's now a mystery around that. And yeah, now you're going to have to figure out what that <laughs> exactly. mystery yeah. is. But like they wall up and and they, you know, close up shop. Now exactly. you notice doors exactly. slamming of businesses all the way down the street, lights going yeah. off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, practically what? you've made this decision because you don't know. 
Yeah. <laughs> but but now you you've turned that into into a huge creative choice, which is which is so cool. Um, and it buys you time to figure out what that mystery actually is. You're like, yes, oh, good, I have yeah. time to do this now. I, exactly. And then, you know, uh, my only other thought with, with that is, you know, the another sort of thing that uh, we, again we talked about earlier is is uh, just just pick what you know. Um, you know, if uh, if you're trying to uh, get across some some character backstory and stuff like that. Uh, is there a weird set of, you know, did you have like an ant or something that collected those spoons? You know, the spoons? You oh, guys yeah, know, know the spoons. spoons. Of course. I know the spoons. Uh, and now they have the spoons and they're clearly like prominently displayed and there's the spoons. And so when your character- I don't have like, the spoons for that. The spoons. Yeah, yeah, I still got the spoons for it. Um, uh, when someone's like, what's up with the spoons? Now you can talk about the spoons and just your aunt becomes a fantasy character uh, in, this, in the tale of these spoons. Uh, one last question. Uh, and then we'll get out of here. I, I dig this uh, to sort of sum everything up. I think Gremlins Live asks how how in depth should you go when describing a city? So what, when's enough enough? When's too much too much? Oh man, I mm -hmm. I think it depends on the city and it depends on the table. I think if you have a table of players that are very new to D and D, really in depth descriptions can help them a lot. In particular. If you've got players that like wouldn't know what to do when they get to a town, like, look, I've got a, a, a table I play with on Friday nights. And like, as soon as we get somewhere, I'm sorry, you are going to have no time to describe that city. We are already setting something on fire. And that kind of players, like you have to, to know your players to that extent. But a group of people who are like, I don't really know what I would do when I get there. You know, we're just kind of set loose in this town, giving those in-depth descriptions and putting like flex of intrigue on a few different buildings to give them that choice. Um, I, I just think it varies so much. Mm -hmm. I thought John Roy's recent piece on the site on D&D Beyond about building an immersive immersive world without being boring was really helpful for a lot of that kind of mm. stuff. I'm like learning how to like keep that balance. Cause I, I'm the same way. I, I also, I'm garbage at reading off a description, even if I wrote it. Like I find that when I, you give me a wall of text, I, I start getting like mumbly mouth and mealy mouth over it and start like, just like, I, I talk too fast. I'm not a good cold reader. So like, mm -hmm. if you give me a line and stuff to recite, great. If, mm -hmm. if Even if I write a paragraph, I, I'm halfway through the paragraph and I'm like, this is bad. I'm doing it bad. So it's hard for me really <laughs> to describe. So. I, in that regard, I I like maps a lot more than descriptions, but obviously like that depends on your table as well. If your players mm -hmm. like maps, if you're it's easier to get to maps or not. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do have a tendency when I know that I'm going to have a city in a story or a town, I do tend to search for a map at least to have an understanding of what I want it to look like. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that I, I tend to be more visually oriented, especially for newer players, because I think it's really hard for newer players to to get that theater of the mind going at first. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think the sage is right that it really does depend on the level of experience of the players and also what mm. the players like energy is. Some some people you have players that have been that will ask you every possible question they can about the city that you're in. Mm -hmm. And if you know you have a player like that, be, be prepared because it's not going to stop happening. So yeah. it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is very much a thing to be ready for. But yeah, yeah, I think right, it's, I think and, it's about, mm -hmm. Oh, I was as a side note, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, really sort of enjoying maps. Some, I wish I could credit, but it was a couple of weeks ago, and Twitter, Twitter runs through you, man. Uh, 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 someone, someone was like, "My trick, if if I just need a map handy and nothing's prepped, uh, Google." Um, uh, uh, shopping mall maps yeah yeah mall maps. oh i, I did like, see that on twitter yeah for the layout brilliant. like multi-level mm -hmm. i yeah. did see that so on so good and, and just yeah just pretend that like you know the the the, the concourse area the, the walking through area is is road or or, or mm -hmm. you know however you want to do it but i i thought you that was so stalls brilliant. going down yeah um, i also but, do want to say that i think your players will let you know when they feel like they've gotten enough information on that when you start describing the city when you just get to something in the city that spark something for them. When you mm -hmm. describe the right building or stall or NPC that stands around, they'll be like, oh, I want to go talk to that person. Or I'm heading to, you know, I'm heading to get food or I'm heading to the shop because I need a potion. I know I need to see an herbalist, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of the time, each player has like a little something that they want to accomplish when they get to a town, especially if they've been traveling or you're kind of in that coming out of an in-between stage. I think they will cut you off. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know any ta table of players that will like just 
let you go for that long yeah. for like an embarrassing amount of yeah. time yeah i think uh you know i guess my sort of last thought is um uh in depth is and how in depth is is an important question but i i think um no matter how in depth you go, whether it's like a, a couple of lines and you're sort of making it up as you go along, or you have prepared like a paragraph or two to really get into this place. Um, I, I think just keep in mind, at, make sure you're asking yourself, like, is this in benefit of the game? And is this benefit of my, my players? Because your description can be absolutely incredible. But if your players are like, well, is this place a thing? And you're kind of like, nah, is this place a thing? Nah, like always, always make sure that you are um, you're rewarding your players' curiosity about this immersion that you're creating with with moving uh, with moving them forward. Whether it's here's the quest or here's an interesting sort of like side trip, always make sure that uh, mm -hmm. this immersion that we're talking about is in service um, of those players. Hey, say, Ryan, where can people find you on the internet? Oh, hey, you can find me everywhere on the internet at Not Sage. I stream on my channel every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. We do community and spooky games. Uh, I am also a co-founder of the Pixel Circus channel. We do a bunch of TTRPG content all the dang time. It's very, very fun. I'm also on the official D&D YouTube and Twitch channels for the Black Dice Society and on Smosh Games all the time. All amazingly cool stuff. Please, please, please go make sure you check it out, especially Damsel's Dice and Everything Nice. It's such a fun show. Who uh, Joe came can... in to be Merlin. I did, and I didn't realize that you could donate to affect the game and make them break into a musical for two minutes. It was a thing. Uh, <laughs> it is a it thing. It was super, super fun. Riley Silverman, uh, my love, I miss you so much. I can't wait to be back you, uh, you live like two blocks from me, and I haven't seen you in a year. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter at Riley J Silverman or on Instagram at Riley Silverman. And actually, this coming Monday is the season finale of The Broken Pact, which is the uh, Wizards of the Coast sponsored D and D show that I do for Saving Throw Show. And then also, I am a member of an all-female improv and theatrical collective called Ripley Improv, and we have a brand new show debuting at the beginning of May. And on and tomorrow, we're announcing what the genre is and what it's going to be. And uh, I think it will be very very exciting and i think you will all enjoy it so we're excited to see what happens it's it's Make sure you follow it'll, it'll along. really be up the alley of a lot of people who are fans of the kind of stuff that we do here perfect so. perfect Perfect. Yeah, make sure you guys are following along two really incredible people who we're very lucky to have uh, on these panels. So and uh, we're also very lucky to have you guys. Thank you so much uh, for being here, for watching. And again, because uh, I see it in the comments, uh, in the chat, if, you're, if your reaction is like, cool, I sure wish I had a table, go to the D&D Beyond Discord, go to our forums. There are people that are always looking uh, for someone to play with. Uh, uh, this game's for everybody. You deserve to be able to have that game. Uh, so please uh, go go check out those spaces. Find a group, uh, jump in, and and uh, and play. And if they're not the right fit, find the next one. You know, it's it's like finding the right therapist, right, guys? Um, uh, until then, though, uh, we will see you guys uh, on Thursday here at D and D Beyond. Take care of each other. Be nice. Bye. D and D Beyond now fits in the palm of your hand with the free D and D Beyond app. It's the perfect tool set for beginners, regular players, and seasoned dungeon masters. Play faster with a guided character creator and access your character sheets, spells, and abilities wherever you go. All of your adventures and source books are at your fingertips, even when you're offline. Easily find and access the rules you need when you need them. With more features to come, download the free D&D Beyond app today.